There is a school of thought in this world on the topic of success that dictates revolutionary change is the only way to bring about success in any endeavor. Now, some of the best advice that I have been fortunate enough to be blessed with has been the exact opposite. Rather, success is derived from a number of small changes consistently over a period of time. Now, that's all fine and good for personal or business goals, but how does that translate to the car world? There are going to be two recurring themes throughout this episode. The first, a number of changes in strategic areas of the vehicle, and second, the incredible way this thing is screwed together. Let's start with the first. The engine, that really hasn't changed. It's the same 3.5 twin turbo V6, 416 horsepower, 442 pound-feet of torque. The thing they have changed is they've optimized the combustion cycle. I can't honestly tell you what they did there. We'll have to determine that out on the road. Then there's the transmission that also hasn't changed. 10-speed torque converter automatic. However, they have changed the transmission logic, which does contribute to the fuel economy. And here it's kind of good and it's kind of bad. 18, 29, 22 combined. Now the reality is, whenever you see these twin turbo V6s, whether in a Lexus or a Ford, the EPA estimates are always very good. But people like myself driving them in the real world, I will never see 29. And granted, there is a very simple reason for that. The minute one puts their foot into it, it replicates the fuel economy paradigms of a V8, not of a V6. Then there's where does all that power go? This one is rear wheel drive. However, all wheel drive is indeed on offer. Then there are performance figures here, very respectable, 4.6 seconds to 60 and 136 miles an hour. Then we must press on to the way this thing is built as it relates to the engine. You guys know I am a design nerd, but design generally does not extend to underneath the hood of vehicles. Yes, I have yelled at you about, let's get rid of the Tupperware and like BMWs and AMGs and demand a naked engine. Here, when we do get rid of the Tupperware, the plumbing, like simple, basic stuff that OEMs do not spend money on, it is a work of art here. Like, I want to take it out of this engine and put it on the wall of the hangar when I give the car back. This is kind of the difference of, like, Toyota from other car manufacturers. They have so much money, they probably have an engineering department that is only focused on OCD things like this. So 4,916 pounds, or depending on how you express your weights and measures, 2,230 kilograms. But what's far more interesting than the weight is how it's parsed out. If this were the most basic LS500, it would be about 200 pounds less. If it were all-wheel drive, it would be about 140 pounds more. But far more interesting than that, this car is fitted with the optional air ride, and that accounts for 77 pounds of the 4,916-pound curb weight. With that. Oh yes, that is Sport Plus. Oh yes, man, that thing pulls. Now one would think a car this size would have a hard time being motivated by a 3.5 V6, even with two turbochargers. But here we learned a couple of years ago, it works incredibly well. Uh, no, that sound, it's not real. It's something that comes out of the speaker. It sounds good while you're driving the car. The shifts are imperceptible as you would expect in a Lexus, but it still gives you some leash to have some fun. However, speaking of leashes, the safety system, I've got it switched off right now, but there is no complete off. Obviously, these cars aren't designed to do what you and I, like there it is, the safety system, that's full tap on the gas, and it just won't go. Granted, the car is probably saying it's a Lexus, please don't launch it off this canyon road. So I would ask for more of a leash in Sport Plus mode. That's one thing that would be wonderful to change. Overall, this, it's an unusually good package, however, I can't help but thinking how much more interesting this would be with the 5 liter V8 that's naturally aspirated. Perhaps the F Sport, that's what it should be. Something that has more of a, a guttural sound and a guttural feel from an NA V8. So let's you and I pick up that first recurring theme of a number of small changes. And you are most likely looking at that thinking, I don't notice any change. Well, I kind of thought that would be the case. And when this was booked, we decided to book a 2020 
Lexus LS500 as a reference point. And only with the two cars near each other do you understand the differences. Like for example, there are subtle changes to the front and rear bumpers, there are subtle changes to the grill, and they do make a change to the headlights, their triple beam projector headlights. But overall, they didn't change what Sugasan and the team did back in what, it was introduced in 2017? And that, I felt, was a very successful design because it was a huge departure from Lexus. And what they did there was stop copying Mercedes-Benz. Every LS that came before this looked like a knockoff of an S-Class. This doesn't look like an S-Class. Now, I feel it's very successful in the front of the vehicle. It's very organic. It's frankly more sporting than an S-Class. However, in the rear, that's where it kind of loses things. The height of the greenhouse is just too tall. The overall daylight opening, it just looks too big. It doesn't have the right proportion for the rest of the vehicle. So if I were changing things, I would absolutely keep the front of the vehicle, but lower the height of the greenhouse, which I know is crazy expensive, and they probably wouldn't do that in a mid-cycle refresh. And then I'd also change the height of the rear deck, bring it up a bit, and this way it would bring the proportions of the vehicle together and make it one more unified, cohesive design. So continuing that theme of a number of small changes, revised dampers, revised stabilizer bars, revised spring rates both front and rear, as well as lighter weight control arms. Can I honestly tell you that there is a huge difference in the way this vehicle drives? No. Now granted, part of that is an unfair comparison, that other 2020, it's an executive model, meaning you can't compare it against an F-Sport, whether it's 2020 to 2020 or 21 to 21. So there's good control over squat and dive. That's something that's impressive considering the car it is. However, pitch, there's okay control over pitch, meaning just pitch side to side. However, there's a squat in each corner. When I wanna push it in corners like this or drive it aggressively around town, you feel some pitch onto the rear side of the vehicle, outside of the vehicle. So right now, I can feel it pitch over to the rear right of the car, now to the rear left. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play your favorite game on the Options Game with today's contestant. A car in today's day and age that is all too often overlooked in favor of large, gas-guzzling, sport utility vehicles and crossovers. Any sane human being would classify this as a crime. Anyway, we press on the 2021 Lexus LS500 for a base price of $79,600. Then we must discuss the color. This car turned up in the hangar and I was bowled over by the Matador Red. The burgundy absolutely comes off the page with the very unique dark gray mirror finish wheels. I'm even not complaining about the black interior because the way they do it with the color and trim. Granted, I'd like a saddle or maybe two-tone black and saddle, but I'm not complaining. Then we press on to the first option, which is the Lexus Safety System Plus. This is the Lane Keep Assist, the Adaptive Cruise Control. No, this is not a self-driving car. It will just keep the car in the lane and distance between the car in front of you and this for $3,000. Then the air suspension, this is also a different type of ride height system. One of the changes they made is lowering the access ride height. So you look at this car when it's parked and it looks slammed on bags. It is very cool and probably worth the $1,400. Then the digital rear view mirror. That is a change, one of those small changes for 2021, but you must pay extra for it, $200. Then arguably one of my most favorite options on this vehicle, a 24 inch diagonal head up display. Admittedly, I'm a bit of a sucker for this type of tech, but I would not be overstating things and referring to this as one of the better party tricks of this rig and well worth the price of admission of $1,220. And we press on to the Mark Levinson audio system. Normally works pretty well on Lexus, but here it's a bit more important because it changes the color and trim and the fit and finish Remember I talked about that whole theme of the construction of the vehicle of the speaker grills, which works in conjunction with the different themes that one can select on the inside of the vehicle. So also well worth the price of admission of $1,940. 
Then we press on to arguably the most important option in this vehicle, and that is the F-Sport package. Yes, it adds variable gear steering, but most importantly, it adds all-wheel steering and then adds active stabilizer bars. So no, it's not a 48-volt system like in the Audis or some of the Mercedes we've driven, but it does work very similar to the active anti-roll bars in the BMWs. I would say also well worth $7,800. Let me press on to the panoramic sunroof. Why is that optional in an almost $80,000 car? $1,000. Uh, then something else panoramic, and that is the monitor, $800. And then something that is most likely the least expensive option on any Lexus, and that would be the rear bumper applique. That is the clear coat over the bumper so you don't scratch your bumper as you load stuff into the trunk, $95. Then the illuminated door sills, I am a sucker for these, well worth $450. And then the trunk mat, cargo mat, that kind of stuff, that is $305. The only other thing we add is the destination handling from Tahara, Japan, $1,025 for a total retail price of $98,000. $990. Then we press on to probably the biggest change, one you could notice that's been in front of your face throughout this entire episode, and that would be the screen. Now, this is the point of the episode where you have to excuse me as I let a little design nerd fall out of my pocket. I just do not like this. It is a departure from what used to be arguably one of the best looking interiors in the business. And it was also incredibly organic. Two parallel flowing lines throughout the interior made this a wonderful place to be. There's no other way to describe this. This screen, it just looks tacked on. Then there's some functionality problems. Uh, remember the Escalade we drove, believe it or not, on these same roads. That was the first automotive application for an OLED screen. If you're gonna do this, you need the OLED screen because I've got some sun coming up from my left shoulder and I don't have really good visibility onto that screen because the sun washes it out. Now that you and I have made our way through the changes, let's step back to why this car, at least to me, is important. And that would be the fit and finish as well as the color and trim. Uh, you look at that 2020 executive that's in the hangar, it has, the only way to describe it, Frank Lloyd Wright-esque dark wood. It is otherworldly when matched with the interior. There is even wonderful fit and finish down where the seat controllers are, so below your hip point. Usually cars, even fancy cars, kind of skimp there. It's a lot of details like that that make one stand back and say, wow, this is truly quite a magnificent thing. This is a complete different paradigm shift. It's not the usual, hey, let's build something special from Europe. This is, I want something different. I want something that stands out, but still, I guess, understated. But I want something with a more Japanese influence. Okay, so I may have gone a bit overboard there. As such, I'm going to file away my inner design nerd, at least for now, and focus on bringing together those two disparate recurring themes, the change as well as the way this thing is screwed together. And here I had to really reflect after driving it, having not driven it for many years. And the only way to describe the Lexus LS500 is as follows. This is the best car made that no one buys, which brings us to the wish list. And here I'm not going to ask for my usual 48 volt suspension system or some sort of plug-in hybrid or something like that. Here I have a very simple request. Don't stop making it. Yes, I understand it is very tempting to take the money for this project and put it into a full-size fancy SUV that people will buy by the bushel load. But that would be not just a crime, it would be a travesty because this is too good to put out to pasture and not be on offer as at least a reference as to what a luxury car should be. Because 
I would go so far as saying this is better than most out there today. And this is the point of the episode where I turn it around to you guys to opine in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV, all one word, Moto Man TV, all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And is there anything else we should be adding to the wish list? Or am I being too lofty or asking for too little? Until I see you in the next episode, be spade out.